Hello again, everyone. I'm Joe Longinusa, welcoming you to another edition of Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, the show where industry leaders, golf professionals, and legends all come and discuss the great game we love so much. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our host to tell us who's next on the tee. Chris, take it away. Hey, thank you, Joe. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming back and joining me today on Next on the Tee. We know you have a lot of choices for shows and podcasts to listen to out there, and we really appreciate that you've chosen to make Next on the Tee one of them. We are brought to you by the great folks over at the French Lick Resort. You can find them online at FrenchLick.com. And our new friends over at the Leather Shop, makers of top-quality custom-made leather shoes. You can find them at the-leather-shop.com. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and today I get the privilege of sharing two interviews that I did, one with Allison Kurt and the other with Tony Jacklin. Allison is a PGA Master Professional Instructor, which is the highest PGA credential that you can earn as an instructor, and she is one of, uh, one of only 11 women to be named a Master Professional and the youngest to ever do so. Last fall, she was also named the National Teacher of the Year by the LPGA, and coming up soon, you'll be able to see her sharing some of her tips on the Golf Channel as well. You hear about, you'll hear about all of that and much more when I play that interview for you here in just a few moments. Tony Jacklin, as I'm sure you know, won the 1969 Open Championship and the 1970 U.S. Open. He was elected to the World Golf Hall of Fame in 2002, and he captained three victorious Ryder Ryder Cup teams for uh, the European side back in the 1980s. And he was also part of perhaps the most famous moment in Ryder Cup history in 1969 when Jack Nicklaus conceded Mr. Jacklin's two-foot putt on the 18th hole to have their match and end the Ryder Cup in a draw. It's also uh, you know, famously known as the concession, which, ha- which happens to be the name of the golf course that Jack Nicklaus and Tony Jacklin co-designed in Bradenton, Florida. So we'll hear about all of that and much, much more when I play that interview for you here in the second half hour of the show. So we're going to have a lot of fun today. It's going to be another insightful show. I'm so glad that you're here to take the journey with me this morning. But let's start the show off right by helping you start your mornings off right, and that is by going to our friends over at Aroma Ridge because they offer an array of the finest mountain-grown gourmet coffees that you're going to find anywhere. You can find them online at aromaridge.com. Their secret? Hand-selected beans from a variety of coffee-producing countries from around the world. They roast those beans to perfection by their very own roast master. Those coffees are roasted specifically for you, and I'm not joking about that, specifically for you. And if you like a little flavor in your coffee, and they have almost any flavor you can imagine, plus, you know, you can even mix and match, you know, flavors to create your very own. So I'm currently drinking their uh, Wicked Jack's Tavern Butter Rum Coffee, which is fantastic. I've been drinking that for the last several weeks. They also now have a, uh, an added, added a line of biscotti cookies, which I can't wait to try. And not only are their coffees great folks, but they are fantastic people as well. You're not going to find a better tasting coffee or a better group of people to deal with anywhere on the planet. Check out their products online at aromaridge.com. Next on the tee is also brought to you by our friends over at the French Lick Resort up in French Lick, Indiana. Folks, you hear me talking about it all the time, but you want to talk about a spectacular resort to both play golf and to just sit back and relax and enjoy yourself. Well, you're not going to find a better place anywhere than the French Lick Resort. Go to FrenchLick.com to see for yourself why I say that every single week here on Next on the T. Let's hear a word from our friends over there. Now's the time to plan that golf getaway you've been dreaming about at French Lick Resort. We have new Golf Academy packages for 2016, guaranteed to take your game to the next level. Try our one-day Quick Fix Academy for golf emergencies. For more in-depth learning, try the Game Changer, designed to make you a better player. Our staff professionals are ready to work with you at French Lick Resort. Did you know there's only one place in the country that you can play courses designed by two members of the World Golf Hall of Fame on the same property? The Pete Dye and Donald Ross courses at French Lick Resort make us an ultimate golf destination for 2016. Check out the Ultimate Golf Package, the Hall of Fame Package, and other great offerings at FrenchLick.com. Let 2016 be that year you finally take your dream golf getaway at French Lick Resort. Play the courses champions play. 
Folks, I promise you, it is spectacular. My family and I went up there and spent some time there last summer, and we're looking forward to doing the same again later this year. The French Lick Resort needs to be on your list of places to stay and play. And oh, by the way, my friends, they have a casino right there on the property as well. For more information and to book your stay, go to FrenchLick.com. We're also sponsored this week by The Leather Shop. You heard me mention it in the intro. Let's hear a word about our friends over there. Check out our friends at The Leather Shop, the only company in the world with the ability to provide true, custom-fit, handcrafted, full-grain leather shoes and boots online. That's right. No need to leave home for quality handmade shoes. The best part? The models on their website are mere suggestions. You can request customizations to any design shown or submit your own unique design. No extra charge. For more information, visit our website, nextonthetea.net, and click the TLS logo on the bottom of our homepage, or to visit them directly, go to www.the-leather-shop.com and click your country's flag in the top left corner. That's www.the-leather-shop.com. Yeah, they've got a wonderful array of shoes and other leather products on their site. Check them out online. Again, the-leather-shop.com. And every week here on Next on the T, we like to kick off the show by saluting the brave men and women serving in every branch of our military. We also want to thank all of you for your daily sacrifices that you and your families make to protect our freedoms and our liberties. We also want to thank our veterans for all that you and your families have done for us over the years. It's through the strength of our military personnel that our way of life is even possible. Our sincere thanks as well to Sean Cruz and the wonderful folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. It is such an honor for us to have Next on the T be a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. I also want to remind our veterans, continue to be sure to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org. What a wonderful site with an uh, array of news and articles that are specifically geared towards our veterans out there. I'm sure you're going to find it both interesting and beneficial for you. Again, globalvoiceforveterans.org. All right, folks, I had the wonderful privilege of talking with PGA Master Professional Allison Kurt recently, uh, earlier this week, and uh, what a wonderful time I had and uh, continue to have every opportunity I get to, you know, to speak with Allison. So I want to play that uh, interview for you now. Now making her third appearance with me on the French Lick Resort guest line is Allison Kurt. Let me remind you about Allison's background. She's from Ellisville, Missouri, outside of St. Louis. She played her college golf at Florida State, where she earned degrees in psychology and professional golf management. She went on to get her master's in clinical psychology with an emphasis in marriage and family therapy at Pepperdine University. On the tour, she won the 2012 Western Sectional Championship and earned an exemption into the LPGA Championship. She competed in the LPGA's Wegmans Tour Championship in 2012 and 2014, as well as a third major last year at the KPMG Women's PGA Championship. She is a PGA Master Professional Instructor, which is the highest PGA credential that you can earn as an instructor, and she is one of only 11 women to be named a Master Professional and the youngest to ever do so. Last fall, she was named the National Teacher of the Year by the LPGA, and I am so thrilled to have her next with me again this morning. Hey, Allison, how have you been, my friend? I am awesome, Chris. Thank you so much for having me back on the show. It is always so fun to chat with you, and gosh, what a mouthful. It uh, really kind of makes me reflect on how much uh, amazing stuff has happened this past year. Yeah, no, you've had you've had a tremendous 2012, uh, 2015, and goodness knows 2016, I'm sure, is off to an awesome start as well. <laughs> National Teacher of the Year, how awesome is that? Talk to me about what it was like when you got that phone call. Wow, well, it was really exceptional just to learn that I won the Western Section Teacher of the Year for the second time in the row, and um, just a few years after I, I first won it. And so typically when you win a section award in the LPGA, that puts you on the ballot for the national recognition. And then from there, there's a committee that um, that votes from the section winner. So the competition is very, very stiff. And all the ladies this year who won their section awards are, are very, very bright and accomplished. Um, so to get the call from our, the at-time national president, Dana Rader, was absolutely amazing, completely unexpected, um, I, I remember looking at my phone call saying, gosh, who is this call from 
from North Carolina. Uh, should, is this a collect call? Do I need to, uh, you know, send this to voicemail? And I decided to pick it up, and boy, I'm glad that I did. Um, and, and Dana Rader told me that that I won. And gosh, to get a call from Dana Rader like that is just so memorable. And, and I remember hanging up the phone and just almost shaking because I was so happy um, to accomplish something um, a, as big as this. So it, it just sort of continued on. There was a lot of publicity about it within the LPGA and the PGA, and it really opened up some some opportunities for me to uh, become a speaker and, and talk at some teaching and coaching summits. And then I was really able to honor that at the PGA merchandise show early in January where my family came to, to support me and I had to make a speech, you know, kind of encapsulating my thoughts and feelings about everyone who's ever influenced me, which is very difficult to do in five minutes, but I think I pulled through <laughs> fairly well and was able to um, – enjoy the experience. So it's very memorable. Yeah, and I saw you also recently had the opportunity to do a segment with Michael Breed on the Golfix, you know, which airs on the on the Golf Channel. Talk about getting to show off your teaching skills now on a national level. Yeah, so that was last June when I was at the KPMG um as a as a player, they asked me to do a short segment with Michael Breed. And they gave me a couple of questions about 40 minutes before uh, we were filming. And so I had very, very little time to prepare. So it actually put me in a, in a comfortable position because it was just like teaching. You know, what would a student ask me except these questions were coming from, from Michael? And it was such a cool experience that um, the segment turned out really great, and I have a couple of copies of it. And it's really cool to see yourself on TV doing your craft almost like an out-of-body experience. So that was really, really exciting and fun to do with that. And so recently the LPGA selected a few top instructors from their membership and asked them to do a couple of 90-second tips that will air on the Golf Channel. And so I was one of the lucky instructors to be selected and a very, very talented group there as well. So we spent the day in Daytona filming a bunch of different topics uh, and content, and they will be running the rest of the year. So that is uh, to be aired, and I'm excited to see how those come out. Yeah, so I mean, now, now you've sort of wet our whistle. What, can we get a uh, kind of peek behind the curtain? What what tips are uh, we get to look forward to that uh, that you shared? Well, I'll leave a little bit to be surprised, but I'll tell you that there's some great content from short game to some mental approaches to increasing distance. Uh, in your game. So some topics that a lot of students continually ask me about, and hopefully I'll be able to address those in a short and consolidated way so they can take yeah. away uh, some good, solid fundamentals from the TV and try that out on the range. All right. Well, I certainly look forward to uh, to seeing those. So keep tuned, everybody. Again, on the Golf Channel, take a look. Look for Allison Kurt's uh, tips there. And, and Allison, some of the other things that, you know, you talk about working with students, and I know you put your, your, your degree in psychology to work when you're, you know, when you're working out there with your students and talking with your students. How do you go about instructing young people to stay patient out on the golf course? You know, if we hit the ball out of bounds or you hit it into some other unplayable lie, what are some of the things that you share with folks to kind of keep themselves from going completely off the rails in the middle of a round? <laughs> That's a really great question because I think before I had my education in psychology, I could really only speak to that on such a level of, you know, how did I manage myself from, you know, not freaking out and getting off the rails. And so now I can really speak to those questions on a much more clinical basis, have a little bit more substance, um, especially now that I'm working on my doctorate degree and continuing my education in clinical psychology, um, you know, I like when that question comes up because I have a little bit more substance to work with them about. So I like to find out where the root, first of all, of that emotion comes from. So if they're continually feeling frustrated on the golf course, sometimes it is related to their performance. Oftentimes it's sort of underneath the layer related to other stuff going on in their life. So, for example, maybe someone just had a really bad business call or they had a rough day at work and now they're hitting some shots on the golf course that aren't in line with where they think they should be hitting it. And it's really a culmination of all these different areas, what's frustrating at their work and in their life, as well as what's happening on the golf course. So through, through dialogue and talking, I like to find out what's really the source of the anger 
And if we do find that the source of the anger is strictly performance related, well, now the next question is what are some better ways to handle that emotion, whether it's um, just being irritated or they just feel like they want to give up. What are some better ways to handle it? And I think we can all agree that going into the emotion deeper, becoming more irritated, more angry, more upset doesn't help. So we have to realize, be able to snap ourselves out of it and say, what's a better approach? Starting with a deep cleansing breath is first and foremost the best way to kind of get yourself centered. Um, step away from that shot and say, okay, if I am not going to be able to perform because I'm being hijacked by this particular emotion, what can I do differently? Um, I use some visualization and some breathing techniques to help players sort of externalize or get out of their body that emotion. Um, I had a, a junior golfer tell me one time, which I thought was really beautiful, that she came up with this on her own, that she often felt like she was in a cage. And when the emotions became stronger, that cage became tighter and tighter. So she needed to have a key to open up that cage and be able to walk out from that um, emotion. And so through some wow. uses of breathing and visualization, I think that's a really great and basic way to start for most players. Yeah. And, Allison, for for us, you know, for the, we weekend warriors, you know, there's a, there are a lot of things that we hear, you know, for you know going out and playing on the weekend and, and you know kind of kicking the rust off that uh, happens during the week or you know over the winter time where we haven't gotten to play for for several months. What what are some things that you recommend that we do to kind of get ourselves? sort of back into into the golf mode and get our swings kind of going again if we if it's been whether it's been just during the week and we haven't been able to play until the weekend or if, you know now as you know for a lot of us we're just starting to see temperatures start to warm up so we're just starting to think about getting our golf clubs you know out again what 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 can we do to kind of get ourselves back into a good you know frame and and get our swings going again I like to start players coaching them to start small So really having them not pick up where they left off last fall, but to start new and to start small. So, you know, get out the the wedges and start chipping around the greens. You know, the grass might be a little bit different with the overseed and some of the grasses being dormant. So I'd really have them start working on some chipping and pitching first. Also, when they bump into kind of pitching, they're working on contact, you know, hitting a square face. Uh, with that golf ball, seeing that pitch go up with a lot of spin, and then start to step your your way back into some full swing wedges, some nine irons, some eight irons. So really starting small. So if a player has had a couple of months off just based on um, weather, conditions, holidays, all that sort of stuff, or they haven't been able to come out during the past couple of weeks um, due to life, start really small. Go from shortest to longest. Stay away from hitting the driver 100% full speed. That's going to increase frustration level right from the beginning. Um, It's also going to increase your risk for injury, too. You know, I always relay this to how would you start running a marathon? If you've got, you know, 20-plus miles to run, do you sprint your first mile? No. You start with a warm-up. You start kind of slow in your beginning, and then you kind of peak, and then you start to taper down. So let's do that in our golf games, too. Let's start small. Improve contact, feel good about um, hitting some of those chips and pitches and, and hearing that really pure sound off of the face, and then work your way back up into some fuller swings. That's going to help the confidence as well. Yeah, no, that's great stuff. And, Allison, you, you've got a lot of great drills on your site, AllisonKurtGolf.com. One of the ones that uh, that I like a lot is you know the, the tip you give about two- to three-foot putts and how to – how we can make those because those t- tend to be the knee knockers, particularly if it comes down to a, you know, a, a something going on between you and your buddies, or, or you know, in a uh, in a club championship or whatever it is. Those are those sometimes are the toughest ones to make. Talk about mm-hmm. how we can make more two and three foot putts. I have a couple of great drills that can really increase the frequency of making those putts, and I find that because that's sort of a guinea range for a lot of players they don't get into the habit of hearing that ball fall into the cup at two or three range, uh, two or three feet range. So they'll be playing, they'll hit a good putt, their buddies will say, that's a gimme, go ahead and pick it up. But now all of a sudden they're playing in the club championship and then the pressure's on and that putt that they used to pick up, now they have to make. 
So the right. first one that I like to do is if you, you utilize a line on the ball or some players will draw a line all the way around, you can set up your golf ball so where that line is vertical. And as you hit a putt, if the line remains pretty straight and pretty vertical, then more than likely you have a pretty square face and path moving into the golf ball. But if the face is a little open or the path is a little bit off, you'll start to see that line start to waver a little bit, and it won't be as sharp and pure. And those are the opportunities for those lip-outs, that dreaded lip-out when you're three feet away. So we need to hit the golf ball with a square face and have a pretty good path coming in so that the ball can be hit purely and fall into the cup. The other drill that I like, which has been featured a little bit in Golf Tips magazine, um, and you might see it coming up soon just on, on TV, is being able to put a distraction in your line. So I like to take some quarters and nickels and dimes and lay them flat right in front of the hole and then get about two or three feet out and hit solid putts into the hole. Now, if you hit a solid putt, that ball is going to roll over the change, the nickels and the dimes, and it's going to fall into the cup. But if you hit it a little bit off center or a little bit with an open face or closed face, the change will jump that golf ball offline and you'll either lip it out or you won't make it at all. So those are my two top drills that I like to issue students when we're working on that two to three putt range. Wow. Yeah, I've not uh, I've not heard the, the coin one, especially if you're going to roll it over the coin. Interesting to give that one a shot. Right. Yeah. Styles, and talk about your own game. How are you playing? I've been playing pretty well. I had a really great playing season last year. I finished off winning the Southern California PGA um, section championship. So that was one of my goals to eventually win that title, and, and so I played pretty well there. I've also been working a little bit on my game just with another instructor, and I like to get some thoughts here and there, and I think all all teachers who are pretty good players like to talk about their golf game. And so uh, last year I worked with an instructor and kind of got some different thoughts about how my body should move through the golf swing. So it's given me something to kind of quench my, my thirst on what to work on. Instead of just hitting balls and, and maintaining, I like to keep moving forward in my golf game. I like to have something to work on. Um, I think what's also been exciting is being a Callaway Master Staff professional um, and using their best equipment. I've been able to really enhance my game by getting properly fit with, with the newest and greatest technology um, to really perform. So as, as busy as I am, I still create and carve out time for practicing. I still play about two times a month just with PGA section events and some LPGA events and have a couple of big events coming up this year. So really looking forward to those and keep working on my short game and my putting and all aspects of my technique. What's it like going from being a master teacher to then being a student? Is it is it hard to, to switch on and off to go from being teacher to being student? I feel like because I'm such a perpetual student in education that it's easy for me to get into um, that student role, especially if it's with someone that I truly respect and they have something to offer me that maybe I haven't thought about in my own golf game. So for me, I find that it's pretty easy. And actually, the conversation is much more filled with depth because I feel like we're talking the same language. And it's not like the first time that this information is being hit towards me. It's more, how can I apply this to my particular golf swing and my body? Um, and I would say that uh, instructors that play a lot tend to be very critical of their game. And sometimes we have to get away from teaching ourselves or being over analytical. So to have sort of a neutral and unbiased perspective is very is a breath of fresh air. So this this golf season, might we see you out at some point, whether it's on a at an LPGA event or somewhere on the Symmetra Tour? Any chance we're going to get to see you out and about on the inside of the ropes? Possibly in a PGA event. I'm going to do a couple of Monday qualifiers. Um, I did not qualify for KPMG unfortunately this year, but I'll have another shot at requalifying in our August. So I will be gearing my game up and heading back to Reunion, Florida to hopefully secure a spot in the 2017 KPMG. Um, I won't be playing in any Symmetra Tour events, but I do have a couple of players that I'm coaching on the Symmetra Tour, so I might make my way out and uh, visit them and watch them play. 
But I, I like to have a really good balance between how much I'm playing versus how much I'm te- teaching to make sure that my needs and are, are fulfilled for that. I'm talking with Allison Kurt, Master or PGA Master Professional Instructor. And Allison, just a couple more before we let you go. Um, for just a couple of more tips that you know, perhaps some of us can can take out to the golf course with us this weekend. What are some things when you're playing with amateurs that you see us you know continually make the same mistakes over and over again? The lack of attention to the basic fundamentals of grip alignment and posture. I think a lot of players get so overwhelmed and focused on the really technical and tough things about the swing, like plane and face angle and hinging and the left arm straight at the top. And and I would say if you have a really solid grip, you have correct ball position for the club that you are hitting, and you have an athletic posture that will allow your body to rotate mechanically and effectively, you will hit the golf ball so much better. And you will be impressed with yourself about how you can take away some of these complex thoughts because your body will move more effectively. It's really hard to hit a drive straight down the middle if your golf ball is positioned in the middle of your stance. Or it's incredibly difficult to get rid of that slice if the left hand is too weak or moved to the left position on on your driver. So pay attention to just basic fundamentals of where that golf ball is positioned for the club that you're hitting how your hands are placed on the handle or the grip, and how are you standing? Have we gotten into maybe a lazy position where our back is more rounded or we're not bending over enough from our hip joints and we have too much knee bend? So be cognizant of those pieces, and the golf swing will be tremendously easier. There you go. And the other question I had, and you just sort of mentioned it a moment ago, was ball position. Many times we hear, you know, play the play the ball from the same position, but you know, and then I hear other folks talking about moving it back in your stance as you as you uh, you know as the club number increases. Talk about ball position. Where where should we be playing the ball depending on you know which iron we're we're hitting? How I teach ball position is really based on just common sense of where the golf club bottoms out on the ground and when it gets back to a square position. So try this out next time just for fun. Take a driver, set it up in the middle of your stance, and then make a really slow motion swing and see what happens when the driver gets back to center. It's going to be open, and it's probably going to be banging into the ground. But if you move that golf ball forward in your stance, you'll be surprised at how there's more time for the face to become square and start to shallow out. So my rule of thumb for ball position is seven iron through wedges. I like to keep that in the center of the stance. And that allows for the club to bottom out into the ground at the right spot to have that low point right when the ball is beaten, touching on the ground, and it allows for that face to be square. And then as we get into six iron, we gradually move that about a half ball width forward from center, and you incrementally continue to move the golf ball up from the six iron, five iron, into your hybrid range, into the fairway woods. And then lastly, driver, I like to keep it somewhere around the left or lead heel. So whatever your lead foot is for a righty or a lefty, we want to keep that golf ball position for the driver around uh, the heel if you draw a straight line up for the heel. And I just think when you look at it, just common sense of how long it takes for a fairway wood or a driver to return back to a square position, it's not going to happen if it's in the center of your stance. But by the time it reaches your lead foot, that that club face will be back to square. Ah, that's fantastic! And uh, you know, just uh, for for those that like to work the ball a little bit, if uh, to your point with the driver, if you put the driver a little, if you if you put the ball position a little bit further towards the center, is that going to give you a better chance? If you're if you're a relatively straight driver, and 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 knock on wood, I, I'm a pretty straight driver of the golf ball. But I'm terrible at being able to work the ball right to left or left to right. It's just for whatever reason I'm ingrained straight, which I don't really want to change. But mm-hmm. to your point, if I move that ball a little bit back towards center, naturally with my natural swing, will that tend to let me fade the ball or kind of slice it just a little bit? It could. And I say that it could because there's really no absolute um, yeah. when it comes to that because you could move your golf ball back and just by having 
a golf plane that would be more inside out, you could really hook the golf ball too much by having it too far back. Um, so uh-huh. if all conditions were kept the same and yeah. you moved the golf ball back for your particular swing, there is a possibility that the club face could be open to allow you to cut the ball. What I like to do when working the golf ball, if I needed to hit a shot on command right or to the left, I like yeah. to keep my golf swing and ball position the same for the most part, but what I like to change is my alignment. So if I'm going to cut the golf ball, I might have my stance open up a little bit so that my swing path starts to move a bit more to the left. And then I might even take my club face and point it just a bit more to the right instead of straight down my target line to create more of that open club face as the club is moving to the left. So I sort of prefer to to modify the alignment a little bit while I get to keep my golf swing exactly the same. All right. I'm going to give that a shot. See how I do. I'll let you know. (laughs) All right. Keep me posted. Thank you. So before we let you go, Allison, remind our listeners again wh- what else they're able to find if they go to your website and then uh, also your YouTube channel as well. So the YouTube channel is always being updated with some new content. So there is a link from my webpage, which is allisonkurtgolf.com, where you'll be able to find some articles written for magazines, some articles for um, newspapers and some tips. Plus you can see a couple of videos that are produced on on how to improve some elements of your game. Also on my website, you'll be able to find my teaching location and online scheduler if you want to book a lesson with me or come in town and work on your game. There's also a link to improve your mental game. So not only can you become a better golfer by just hitting the golf ball straighter and further, but to have a better, better approach with your mind in handling your golf game. So there's some... Um, areas there to improve your mental game. Lastly, I'm a big proponent of Callaway equipment and making sure that your equipment is fit for you and your body. So there is a link on some of the equipment that I use and how to get in touch with that. That's great stuff. And for for everyone listening, it's Allison Kurt Golf, and Allison spells her name A-L-I-S-O-N-C-U-R-D-T, so AllisonKurtGolf.com. And, Allison, how can they find you over social media as well? If you head to the website, there will be quick links to my Facebook business page, Allison Kurt Golf, and Twitter as well. You can look at some Yelp reviews and see some past student experiences. So I like to use Facebook and Twitter to kind of send some updates of some things that are happening, recent accomplishments, student accomplishments or some specials that I might be running on on teaching. So feel free to head out with those same same title, Allison Kurt Golf, on Twitter and Facebook. There you go. Allison, it's it's always so fantastic getting to have you back on the show. I'm so happy for all the all of the success that is has come your way so richly deserved. Congratulations on all of that stuff. I hope you'll come back and join me again soon and share more of your insights with us. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time, Chris. Always enjoyable chatting with you and and sharing about the game of golf. Uh, Thank you very much, Allison. All the best to you and your family, and I look forward to the opportunity to catch up with you again real soon. All right. Take care. Take care, Allison. That was PGA Master Professional and National Teacher of the Year, Allison Kurt. Be sure to check out her site again, allisonkurtgolf.com, and look for her coming up on the Golf Channel. I can't wait to see what tips she's going to share there. We'll get to my interview with World Golf Hall of Famer Tony Jacklin on the other side of this station identification. You're listening to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro. Heard around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Okay, not long ago I had the opportunity to talk with World Golf Hall of Famer Tony Jacklin. We're going to play that interview for you now. Next on the tee is former U.S. and British Open champion and successful Ryder Cup captain, Tony Jacklin. Mr. Jacklin turned pro at age 17 back in 1962. In 1968, he became the first European player to win on the PGA Tour since the 1920s at the Jacksonville Open Invitational. A year later, he won his first major at the Open Championship at Royal Lytham in St. Anne's in 1969. 1970, he won the U.S. Open at Hazeltine, becoming the first British player to win the U.S. Open since Ted Ray back in 1920. 
1985, he captained the European team to a Ryder Cup victory, which marked the first loss by the U.S. team since 1957. Backed that up with a second consecutive Ryder Cup uh, championship in 87, marking the first ever USA loss on American soil. He would go on to make it a three-peat for Europe in 1989. In 2002, he was elected to the World Golf Hall of Fame, and in 2006, he and Jack Nicklaus opened the Concession Club in Bradenton, Florida, commemorating the putt conceded by Mr. Nicklaus to Mr. Jacklin, which ensured the 69 Ryder Cup competition would end in a draw. He's won eight times on the European Tour, four times on the PGA Tour, and twice on the Senior PGA Tour, and I'm very honored to have him as a part of the show this morning. Mr. Jacklin, thank you for being here. My pleasure, Chris. Nice to be with you. I want to start with the beginning in mind, Mr. Jacqueline, if you don't mind. What sparked your interest originally in the game of golf? Well, uh, when I was about nine in 1953, when Hogan had his great year, I was nine years old, and uh, a neighbor came to my father. I can remember him talking over the sort of fence and said he'd tried golf, and he thought my dad might like uh, going, and... uh, my dad went out there, and uh, he was smitten the first time he ever went, and it wasn't long before I was pulling his trolley around and having a go myself uh, when we were out away from the sort of member's eyes, and uh, I-, I took it up right there. I was self-taught, uh, based everything around fundamentals. Hogan was a great inspiration in the early days. I looked sort of, although I never... Uh, saw him play. I played with him, got to play with him in 1970, but in those days it was uh, all from magazines, you know, pictures in magazines Mm -hmm. and and, uh, dreams, really, I suppose. Wow. Now, I saw an interview you did several years ago regarding your Open Championship uh, victory, and you said overall your thought process was to stay close, stay in the hunt, and you never knew maybe the fourth round it would be your day. What did you tell yourself as you were sitting on a two-stroke lead heading into the final round? You had guys like Nicholas and Peter Thompson, Roberto DiVincenzo, Bob Charles uh, chasing you down. But what was your thought process as a guy who held a two-stroke lead going into a final round of an Open Championship? Well, you know, it's it's all a, a mental... Uh, you need a great mental fortitude, and, and uh, there's no substitute for experience there Um, if I hadn't won uh, in Jacksonville in 68 I I managed to pull that first uh, tour went off uh, in 68 playing alongside uh, Arnold Palmer and Don January in the last round so you know that was when Arnold was uh, in his pomp if you like and Mm -hmm. that was uh, you know mentally it was a a big thing to overcome uh, you know, the pressure and heat there and, and win that tournament. And it was a stepping stone to be able to do uh, win, win my first major. You know, getting into that last round with a two-shot, the, the key is, with all of this, is not getting ahead of yourself. And we, we, we all have heard it so many times, you know, staying in the moment. Uh, but the thing is, the more you want something, the more difficult it is to stay in the moment. And right. So it's it's a tremendous uh, mental discipline, and uh, you know I remember being so darn nervous. You know that you've got to wait until two thirty or so in the afternoon to, for your tea time. So you've got to occupy yourself all morning without sort of trying to wonder what's going to happen when you get out there. It's uh, it's a nerve wracking deal, and uh, but you How know about? I was young and I was fit and. Uh, as I say, I, I I started playing the tour when I was 19. I played in my first Open. Actually, that was at Lytham in 63 when Bob Charles won, and I managed to uh, make the cut there. So, you know, it was a golf course I, I kind of enjoyed. Uh, but it, it's tough, you know, it's uh, it's getting it done. But that's just the, the key to it all is, is just staying with the program and uh, not getting ahead of yourself. Easy to say, hard to do. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I mean, I mean, part of it, I think, played into it. I also heard you say that the inspiration you needed was given to you by the fans. You could tell that they really cared, right? So you're you're in front of your home fans playing in that tournament, 
Uh, that's got to be an, an additional piece to try to keep your mind, you know, well, your focus, yeah, if you will. Yeah, it was. But, but you know, the thing was I was playing full-time on the uh, PGA Tour here then. And, you know, the fact that I was doing nicely. and But, you know, I didn't get many followers over here. I got a few. But, you know, Palmer and Nicholas took the, the vast bulk of the galleries with them. And so... When I went home to to play that uh, summer, you know, the galleries turned out to see me, and it was inspiring. You know, I mean, obviously, I was on the top of my game, and uh, but right. it was a great, uh, a great lift to know that the whole lot of people cared about what I was trying to achieve. So, what's it like when they when they hand you the claret jug? <laughs> I mean, I I got to imagine. The emotion starts has got to start pouring out of you at that moment. Yeah, well, it's uh, you know, it's it's tough to explain that. It's a uh, dream come true, obviously, and the oldest championship in your your own uh, your you know your own country's uh, uh, biggest major. It's uh, it was fantastic, and uh, ironically, I'm actually st- still the last Englishman to win uh, the Open. In England, uh, uh, you know, Faldo right. won all his majors in Scotland, and Sandy Lyle is Scottish. He won at Sandwich, so that's one little record that will uh, uh, hopefully get bro- broken before I pop my <laughs> clogs, as they say. But no, it was euphoric. It's um, it's it's hard to get your head around it. The reality doesn't properly sink in for actually months, you know. I mean, it's, uh, you, you, you've you got that with you for the rest of your life. You know, you know you're the Open Champion. You are the Open Champion. It's uh, it's huge. Yeah. I, I, I'm just trying to get into my head. I'm thinking, when you walk away from the course, you get to keep that thing for the year, right? So when you go back to where you're staying, you propping that thing up and just sort of looking at it in amazement? Do you sleep with it? What do you, What do you do with it? <laughs> No, you know they've got a couple. They've, they've got a couple of identical trophies at the RNA. I think one stays at the RNA, uh, but I had it for a year, and uh, you know, little did I know that before that year ended, that I was going to win the U.S. Open and I have the two right. of them together. So, um, no, I just kept it at home, and uh, you know, the irony was I didn't get that many photographs taken. I mean, we're into the digital age now where everybody's taking selfies and doing this, that, and the other with, with phones. I, I promise you I only had uh, very few uh, pictures taken with it, you know, uh, back then. It was the sort of thing you never thought that much about. But um, it, was, uh, it was very special, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't give... Those majors up for all the world. It was, uh, you oh, know, yeah. you look back on a career. I, I, I played for many years all over the planet, and uh, to be able to say that I won two of the biggies is uh, makes me feel uh, good inside. I'm sure. As you mentioned, the following year you won the U.S. Open at Hazeltine. Opening round play was, you know, very windy conditions. You shot 71, while guys like you know, Gary Player shot 80, Jack Nicklaus 81, Arnold Palmer shot 79. Is that, you know, based on all your experience having played over in windy and rainy and, you know, the conditions that you have there over in England and Scotland, was that the benefit or was it something else? Oh, yeah, no, I, I there's no doubt. I was weaned on that stuff, you know, that the wind, and I, I sort of uh, enjoyed playing uh, in those days in, in that kind of weather and uh, certainly got me off to... Uh, uh, a fast start, and I was the only one to break par the first day, and and I very much ever since then, and you know I'm asked often about who I fancy for this tournament or that tournament or who's going to win uh, this or that, and really it's that first round to me is very important. You can't win it in the first round, but you can lose it, and uh, if you can shoot a good first round, you, you're mentally straight away engaged in that thing it's it's something uh, i don't know it, it, it it's uh it's something i've watched and i've talked to other great players about that first round is very important to get your mental juices flowing and catch your attention and you know and you really start thinking you know two or three more rounds like this and i could win uh so 
the first round is uh, ultra important uh, as far as I was concerned. And, and, of course, it got my attention there, and I managed to hang on. I, I increased my lead every day. Right. And one, one by seven in the end. It was it was a week to dream about. And uh, for me, the U.S. Open is probably the hardest uh, tournament major to win because the USGA really do take it to the limits, you know, with regards to the course right. setup and so on. So, um, it, no, I, I mean, I've looked look back over 50 years of playing this game for a living, and uh, that was the week uh, to end all weeks. I mean, I, I really, really uh, had the perfect week that week. So, you know, you've talked earlier about, you know, staying in the moment and the mental focus. This was sort of on the opposite side. To your point, you won that tournament by seven strokes. And we've seen in the past some, you know, leaders, some great players who had a, you know, four, five, six-stroke lead going into a final round and give it all back. Maybe they relaxed. Maybe they lost some focus. You didn't. How were you able to, from the opposite way, keep keep yourself together with that big of a lead? Well, it wasn't as easy as it looked, funnily enough. Uh, you know, with a four-shot lead, I was never more nervous in my life, I can tell you, of going out into a final round because I figured if I don't get this done, I'm going to be labeled as a choker and it, it would be right. you know, something to live with the rest of my life. So uh, uh, those first uh, few holes went fine, and in the middle of the round, I missed a three-foot putt on the, on the eighth, well, on the seventh, I hit a four iron into about three or four feet and missed it. And then I three putted the next hole, and I'd been putting beautifully all week. And on uh, nine, I had about a 35 footer up a slope, and I hit this putt far too hard. And it hit the back of the hole. It could have run straight over the hole, it was going so fast. It hit the back of the hole, jumped in the air, and decided to go in. And when that happened, it was like I just felt the pressure roll away. And, uh, uh, you know, I got myself together okay. on the back nine and made some birdies. And But the the pressure was sort of off. It was almost like a, a switch went on, you know. It was um, – but up until that point, it could have gone any which way. You know, I could have just as easily gone. And if that ball hadn't gone in, who knows what might have happened the last round. Uh, anyway, okay. we won't go there. I, I know what happened. <laughs> no. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was uh, euphoric. It really was. Uh, I made a 30-footer on the last green. I was saying yep. to myself, stood over the putt, you know, what a way to end this would be if I could just make this. As, and I'm thinking it, I'm doing it. And and that is what, you know, staying in the moment is. You know, being in the moment is. It's, uh, it's a great feeling. There's nothing like it when you're... Uh, you know, a pro pro golfer out there. It's a state of mind that uh, it, it's not easy to achieve. It's almost like you've got to go through a, a nervous state uh, state of mind to get to the other side, uh, if that makes any sense. And you, mm -hmm. you get into this sort of cocoon of concentration where nothing can touch you. You know, it's, you, you're just sort of doing what you do best and... Uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a hell of a feeling, and uh, uh, you know you can't always get there. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about your Ryder Cup experiences. You had an amazing run as the Ryder Cup captain. The victory in 1985 at the Pelfrey, the first European win since 1957. You talk about euphoric on your end for winning the tournament, winning at the Open, winning at the U.S. Open. Was this a euphoric of a different nature, being able to you know bring that victory home and bring it to uh your you know to Europe? Yeah, it was very different. You know, I was young when I won my majors. I was 25. Uh, you you couldn't captain a Ryder Cup team at that point in time. Uh, you know, by the time the opportunity came along in the Ryder Cup, I was. Uh, 38 or 9, and uh, uh, timing is everything um, in life. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd played seven times, and uh, we'd turned, we'd gone from Great Britain and Ireland in uh, in uh, 79. That was my last year as a, as a as a player. We went from Great Britain and Ireland to Europe, and in, included Europe, and. Um, 
it didn't seem to make much difference the first uh, you know in in 80 in in 79 and 81 we got beat just as badly as we were getting beat in the sort of 60s and 70s and uh, but you know i felt uh, i knew w- what we were lacking and it was it was basically professionalism i mean uh, we were being sent off to ride cups by administrators who you know, didn't they weren't golfers, and they didn't know what it was like to stand over a four foot putt to to win anything. And uh, you know, we were flying in the back of the bus economy, and Americans were going on Concorde first class. They were all turned out like Adonises when it came to the team photographs, and we were wearing anything anybody would give us. And you know, when they asked me to do this thing. Um, I I was in a situation where I'd sort of fallen out with uh, some of the, um, you know, the hierarchy, the people in Europe, European Gulf that uh, were running the thing. And I didn't care really whether I did it or not. And it was an opportunity. So I said, I said, you know, I'll do it if I can do it on my own terms. And, And I started making these requests, you know, just to be, Level of playing field, basically. You know, let's we need to go first class. Self esteem when you're a professional is is very important. You know, you need we needed to know I needed to know that we could stand on the first tee and we were even. Prior to that we were always the underdog, we always looked worse for wear. Uh, you know, the Americans were two up before um, uh, a stroke was played in terms of just the way they turned out and uh so once we got those things straightened out, and uh, people won't remember this, but Seve Ballesteros was arguably the best player in the world at that time, and they banned him from okay. playing in 1981 uh, uh, because of uh, really? appearance money issues with the tour, and, and, and we, won't, we won't go there. But my first job was to bring him back into the fold because, you know, he was he was something else. I mean, he, I knew I couldn't uh, do it without Seve's help, and it was it wasn't easy. But uh, you know, I told him his his PR was uh, wasn't you know he wasn't enjoying the best press in Europe at the time. Right. And, uh, I said, if we can get this done, you know, I'm going to do everything I can off the course, but I can't do it without you on it. And uh, he responded, and 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 all the players responded with. You know what we what we did. You know we we, we went on Concord, as, as I say, in '83 to Palm Beach Gardens, which was my first time, and um, we came within a whisker of getting it done. I mean, Lanny Watkins hit a wonderful uh, wedge on the last hole, stone dead to be Canizares, and that meant we got beaten by a point. Uh, and for everything that last afternoon, it looked like we were. Um, we were going to take it, and we were very disappointed. I have to say, you know, we were all, you know, banking on a, on a victory because it looked very much that way all that afternoon. But um, I think it was Seve, in fact, that said, that said, you know, this is not a loss; it's a victory. You know, this is the first time we've ever done anything like this in America, and, uh, and you know, so two years rolled round to '85. We took uh, that as a stepping stone to being able to get it done on home turf. You know, we got a lot of support from the British fans. And, uh, well, you know, the rest history. But it was essentially getting that, um, the basics sorted out, you know. And uh, right. the players' self-esteem, they all felt uh, that they were equal to the task. And since then, I mean, uh, we look back and, of course, Europe of of uh, come out on top uh, more often than the U.S., but uh, it's always right. close. And, and that's the most important thing for me. It will go back and forth, you know, and that's and it, and it should. But it's at least a, a contest now, and, and we look forward to it immensely. It's uh, caught the public imagination, um, you know, outside of the Olympic Games and the World Cup soccer. It's about the biggest team thing out there. Uh, right. Which is uh, you couldn't say that much back in 1983 because I, th- I think only the local ABC station took the Ryder Cup, 
Now it's uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's unbelievable how it's changed. Uh, Absolutely, we, it is. we had the gala dinner in '83 in Jack's backyard, right on the intercoastal there in Palm Beach. I mean, think about doing that there now with a the, the attention that the Ryder Cup gets. It's, uh, it's right. extraordinary. Let's talk a little bit about your relationship with Mr. Nicholas. Let's start with the concession at the uh, at the '69 Ryder Cup. You talk about you know. Uh, those competitions being close. It was the first Ryder Cup that ended in a draw, which meant that the U.S. would keep the cup. But you played against Mr. Nicholas as part of the morning four-ball matches on Friday, and you and Neil Coles beat Mr. Nicholas and uh, Dan Sykes one up. You beat Mr. Nicholas four and three in the Saturday morning singles matches, and then in the afternoon matches is what uh, you guys have. So, um you know, Mr. Nicholas had always talked about, you know, the thought of the overall match, you know, was going to be, you know, this is an exhibition. This is, you know, this is something that, you know, helped promote the game of golf. And there was no way that he wanted you to miss a two-foot putt in front of your home crowd and the fans uh, to cost European, you know, the opportunity to win the Ryder Cup. But were you shocked when uh, when uh, he uh, uh, picked up your ball mark? Uh, I was. I was I was surprised. Uh uh, there was an, an element of relief there as well, I have to say. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd won the Open a couple of months before, and I was pretty well prepared mentally, and I knew whatever happened, I'm going to have to make this putt. You know, he'd, he'd hit his approach putt four and a half feet by, and like the great player he is, he, he held the return, and uh, in doing in picking his ball out of the hole, he picked my marker up, and and he said, I don't think you would have missed it, but I would never give you the opportunity in these circumstances, which was a great act of sportsmanship. We were friends and, and, and all that, but we were competitors too. And uh, he he always saw the big picture, Jack. And of course, America retained the trophy that they, they right. won in 67. Uh, so from that point of view. But um, no, he, he, you know, he, he always played the game the right way jack i mean uh, we we've had a of nearly 50 year friendship now and uh, we see a little, i shall see him next week actually we've got a big event at the concession the concession cup we've got all the great amateurs coming from the uk and ireland against uh, some of the great american amateurs so we're having a, a grand occasion where we're, we're both uh, honorary captains of our respective teams so i shall see him this coming week but um you know the course. The course came about. Uh, I'd finished playing my senior career, and I was sort of looking for something to do. And Jack was being courted by uh, the Ritz Carlton in Sarasota to do the golf component. And uh, I went and found a developer and showed him this picture of us coming off the 18 screen at uh, Birkdale in '69. And uh, I said, you know, what about a concession golf course? You know, if if there's maybe more than one or... Anyway, it didn't happen straight away, but the guy, the developer loved the idea and we eventually got it done and got it opened in 2006 and it's uh, turned out fantastic. Uh, we've got a vibrant membership now and some good players. We've got Paul Azinger and... Uh, he's, he's an honor member out there, and uh, Andy Bean, David Ledbetter plays out there. We've got uh, we've just um, wow. got JB Holmes has just bought a home out there, so he's going to be based there. Scott Hoax playing, so a lot of good players and uh, hey. vibrant, that's a vibrant club. It, it's uh, and it's a fantastic test. How how do your designs, you know, your your philosophy of course design and his philosophy of course design, how do those two things compare and how did it come together? Well, you know, at the time we did it, I was actually prepared to bow to Jack's uh, greater experience in, in course design. Obviously, he's got a great team behind him and so on. And he said, no. Um, he said, if we're going to do it, let's do it together. And he said, that's another concession. <laughs> <laughs> which, which was, uh, yeah, quite funny. But uh, what we agreed on was that, you know, we didn't want the greens too big. We wanted it to be challenging, the, the greens to be challenging. I personally didn't like bulk, uh, bulk heading, uh, you know, a la the TPC at 
uh, sawgrass. I, I, I don't care for that. You know, a shot just short is punished by, you know. And so we agreed on, on, on most of it. But, but it was fairly fundamental. We had enough land to get the par threes moving in different directions. We could balance the uh, dog legs left and the dog legs right. A couple of par fives you can get up on, but it's a challenge when you get to the greens. And, and we agreed, you know, just on, on principles. And uh, then it was just a matter of uh, cutting the holes out. The, the property was uh, very flat, old Florida, a lot of oak trees and pines. And uh, we gradually worked through it, you know, trying to retain some of the nicer trees and that, that bring them into play and the like. But, but uh, it turned out great. And... Uh, you know, I met him on each of his visits. He came in six or seven times, I suppose, during the construction, and uh, worked out great. Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful looking golf course. I've looked at it online. It's fantastic. What a what a wonderful layout, Mr. Jacqueline. It's uh it's been an incredible privilege for me to get to uh, spend some time with you this morning. You had a wonderful list of achievements. You've had a great career. I thank you so much for taking time out of your morning. Uh, to be a part of the show. I hope you'll do it again sometime. So much to talk to you about. I'd love to continue to maybe get some more of your insights about the game and and uh, keep the relationship going. But it's been an honor for me to have you as part of the show today. You're, you're very kind, very welcome, and I'd just like to thank uh, all the troops out there for keeping us safe. We appreciate thank what they do, too. Indeed. Thank you, Mr. Jacqueline. All the best to you and your family. I look forward to catching up with you hopefully real soon. God bless you. Thank you. What a wonderful honor it was to talk with World Golf Hall of Famer Tony Jacklin. They've got the second playing of the Concession Cup coming up uh, April 19th through the 23rd at the Concession Course over in Bradenton, Florida. Mr. Nicholas, Mr. Jacklin going to be on hand, so go check that out online as well. All right, folks, it's time for me to put a bow on this episode. Before we close up shop, I want to remind you about our friend and, and partner, PGA Tour Pro Jim Estes and the great folks over at the Salute Military Golf Association and the great things that they're doing. Let's hear from Jim about all of that. The Salute Military Golf Association was created to provide rehabilitative golf experiences to the brave men and women who have been wounded while serving our country. Hi, I'm Jim Estes, PGA Golf Pro and co-founder of the Salute Military Golf Association. With my adaptive golf program, we've successfully helped thousands of soldiers in their recovery, both mentally and physically. The SMGA has been providing family-inclusive golf experiences across the country since 2007. To date, the SMGA has equipped more than 1,000 warriors with properly fitted golf clubs and has extended its clinic series to more than eight chapter and affiliate locations across the U.S. If you are a wounded veteran interested in participating or if you'd like to learn more about the Salute Military Golf Association and find a chapter closest to you, visit our website at smga.org. We've seen firsthand how impactful golf can be in aiding one's recovery. The Salute Military Golf Association, empowering wounded veterans one fairway at a time. Visit smga.org. That's smga.org. Yeah, they're doing some amazing things at the Salute Military Golf Association. To find out more information and to get involved, go to smga.org to see how you can. All right, everybody, my sincere thanks once again to Allison Kurt and Tony Jacklin for making today's show so much fun for me to be a part of. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Please check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me, my co-host Bob Lazari, and our announcer, Joe LaGenusha. You know that show airs live Thursday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You can stream it live on Blog Talk Radio as well as going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. You can also find that show and this one available on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, Player.fm, SoundCloud, so many places that you can find us across the board. Uh, Thursday Night Tailgate, I want to remind you, every week we are joined by legends and stars from around the NFL and the CFL as well. Now Major League Football has come on, and we've got a, a regular uh, segment with the, with, with the folks from over at Major League Football. If you're not aware of what Major League Football is, well, it's a new spring league, and uh, it's going to get kicked off here really soon, so check them out on, at MLFB.com online as well. Please also check us out on Facebook. You can find Thursday Night Tailgate next on the 
Tea with Chris Mascaro. We both have we have a uh, Facebook page for both of those shows. Please give us a like and you know share your comments with us. That's important to us as well. And you can find both shows online. This one next on the T dot net. ThursdayNightTailgate.com. From there, you can stream or download any of our archive episodes for free, folks. Plus, keep up to date with who some of our future guests are going to be as well. Thank you again for choosing to listen to this show today. We really appreciate you guys so very much. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. You've been listening to Next on the T with Chris Mascaro. Where PGA and LPGA legends, pros and top instructors, and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Saturday to hear more stories about the game we love. From the people who love sharing those stories with you. It's all about the great game of golf. It's all about the great game of golf.